Well, welcome back to another RD Works Learning Lab. Well, here we are after nine months, and at last I have a machine that performs reliably and powerfully every time I push the button. It's taken a long time to get this far, but I suppose when I look back, the positive that comes out of it is, if I hadn't have had such a dodgy machine, I wouldn't know half of what I know today, and you wouldn't have seen half the videos that you've seen today. Um, but let's just come back to the picture that's in front of us. It clearly says it's a laser cutter engraving machine. Now this particular machine that you see in front of you is definitely set up for engraving. I know that because the little red dangly bit that's down at the lid there I can see is a lot wider than a quarter of an inch which would suit a one and a half inch focal length lens. That's about three quarters of an inch wide which means that that machine is fitted with a two inch focal length lens which has been set up really for engraving. What is engraving? Now we have touched a little bit on engraving throughout my sessions. Um, we've dealt with the bitmap handle tools and we've done some photographs conversion and we've played with it a bit but it's only been to experiment with the tools that are in RD Works. It hasn't been anything serious. I've done a little bit of acrylic work, a little bit of woodwork, and a little bit of glass work. Now, as usual, when I tackle things, I like to find out where the boundaries are. And at the moment, I know that I'm nowhere near the boundaries of engraving capability on this machine. So what we're now going to do is start off on a completely new session of RD Works Learning Lab. Um, I might put some odd bits and pieces in between, but most, mostly the next few sessions could be anything from 3 to 5 to 25. I don't know because I've got no idea where this is going to lead to. Um, will be all about engraving. Now I've looked around the um, World Wide Web and I've also had a good look through YouTube and there are not many videos there on how to do wood engraving or any other sort of engraving. There's lots of videos there about how to put your photographs onto bits of plastic and bits of wood but they don't really tell you very much. They don't go into the detail, which is what you really want. They, it's more of a, hey, look what my machine can do. I would like to know how this machine works properly. So I'm going to investigate it. And obviously as I investigate it, you're looking over my shoulder and hopefully whatever I learn, you will learn as well. Okay, I think the first thing that we must do is really ask ourselves the question, what are we expecting from this machine? because without a goal, how will I know whether I've ever reached it? We're going to go right back to square one. We're just going to take a look at where engraving came from. Engraving is a, a very, very old print term. Now, printing has been around since just before I was born. In fact, I think it probably started about 2000 years ago in China. Um, here you can see the sort of thing that started the whole printing process off. And this is something called woodblock printing. Now the main thing that I want you to see in this picture is the fact that these characters are standing proud of the woodblock. This is something called relief cutting. And you will find this in RD Works. At one stage we shall see something called relievo, which is obviously the Italian I think for relief. And it's got nothing to do with engraving except that you could do this sort of engraving on a CNC mill type engraver. That's milling rather than engraving because the real engraving looks like this. It is a metal plate that has been cut with a sharp tool and it engraved into little V notches. Those notches are called integlio. I think it's Italian for valley you put ink into those valleys and then you put a piece of paper on top and press it down. And as you press it down, you finish up producing the picture of the hand that you see there. There's only black ink used. All the shades of gray come from a mixture of white and black that takes place in your brain. The mixing takes place in your brain and you get this impression of shadow and lightness. What I want you to see next is an absolute genius of this process that lived in the 1600s. If you stand back from it, it looks just like a photograph. You can get an impression of what I'm talking about if you squint your eyes. But look at the picture carefully. It starts off at the center of his nose as a spiral, 
and it's a parallel set of lines that goes out in a spiral continuously and the line changes thickness as it goes around and that is what's creating this picture. It's a fantastic illusion that your brain is creating for you and even when you look at it carefully you can't believe that it's one continuous line that's just getting thicker and thinner. Quite often these machines are called etching machines as well but they're not really etching machines because etching is a completely different process. This is an etching. The process of producing the copper plate which is filled with ink has to be scratched to hold the ink and there are two ways of scratching that plate. The first one I've just shown you is by mechanical scratching different thickness of lines. The other way is to dip the plate into wax and then scratch the wax off to reveal bare material underneath. And if you look carefully here that's exactly what's happened. Lines have been scratched on a plate and then the plate has been dipped into acid and the acid has actually etched away little grooves in the metal underneath and those little grooves are then filled with the ink. The end process is the same from a printing point of view but the actual process of creating the picture is completely different. Just remember these are engraving machines not etching machines. Now back to the back to the woodblock printing which is where we started from. Now you would think that our machine is not capable of doing any of the sort of printing processes that I've just been talking about. But if we take a look at the something there that's called letterpress, that is in fact relief printing. And we saw that with the Chinese characters. And in fact, I'm fairly confident that our machine is capable of producing something similar to that because it's used for making rubber stamps. And rubber stamps are exactly what we see there block printing. So although we're not going to use our machine for producing um, print masters, we will be using it for intaglio printing. Now whenever you produce a photograph for example on a sheet of acrylic or a sheet of wood you're actually doing intaglio printing even though you're not going to fill it with ink um, and we'll come on to that in a few moments. But it is important that you remember those two words, Relievo and Intaglio, because you will see them crop up in RD Works. Now, what's my ultimate goal? Well, in the middle there, we've got a picture, uh, it's a pattern, which has been relieved. Now, if we look at that, that is relief printing, a bit like the rubber stamp. That's the minimum that I want to get to and possibly if I can get some shape into it I very much doubt whether I shall ever be able to emulate the picture beneath it with the peacock or even the lion but I don't know I've got no idea how good we can get our relief printing. Well here we are in Photoshop and what I've done in my CAD system I've just generated a little patch of rectangles. The whole of this engraving process um, is based on various shades of grey. Let me just open up the colour swatch in here. All colours are made up of red, green, blue if they are light colours as opposed to paint mixing colours. So we're only talking about mixing light here. So we've got RGB which is red, green and blue. And black is actually no red, no green, no blue, no light at all. And the opposite extreme we've got white which is 255 in fact I believe it's yes 255 255 255 so when you've got full amount of blue green and red you actually finish up with white as a color a bit contrary to expectations but that's the way that it works when you mix light together now we're not going to venture into this colored area over here because down the side here you'll see that it runs from white at one end through various shades of gray down to the bottom where it's black and that's the gray scale that we're going to be using. What I'm going to do is to put some distinct steps into these into this color swatch so that we can test how deep each of the grays changes the depth of engraving. 5 into 250 is about 50. So we're going to come down in 50 steps. 
So from white, we'll choose a colour which is about 50 down from that, which is about 200. So we'll just stick with our pointer on the left hand side and drag it down to about 200. It's not absolutely important. And then we'll select that colour and that's a grey, which we will then with our bucket, paint bucket, we will pour that into the first pocket. Then we'll go back and we'll select another colour and this time we'll drag it down by another 50 and we'll bring it down to 150 or thereabouts. Okay, and then we'll pour that colour into our second swatch. And then we'll repeat this all the way down in 50 steps until we get to zero. We shall now save that as a bitmap and import it into RD Works. Well, there's our bitmap in RD Works. Um, I think I might possibly change the aspect ratio of that 10 millimeters. That'll be wide enough for us to see what's going on. <clears throat> you can see it's automatically imported as a bitmap. So if we now go to our parameters here and we will change the speed initially to something very low, like 50 millimeters a second. It's a scan. Um, we've got some advanced settings there which I've got no idea what they do so that's something else we'll have to investigate but at the moment I'm going to just keep things as simple as possible right this is the uh, calibration curve for my machine up on the left hand side here we've got um, watts and across the bottom we've got programmed percentage basically if we look at 10% on this graph we've got about 8 watts, 6 watts actually, and if we look at 20% we've got about 43 watts and it's approximately linear between 10 and 20% and after that it starts to become non-linear or assume a different linearity which is ha happening up there. But let's not work in the upper region, let's go in this lower region here and work between 10 and 20%. So looking at our powers now and I don't know the answer to this question, but I'm assuming that that minimum power will be this white one, which will be 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20%. Well, because we can only use very low powers between 10 and 20%, I think I'm gonna drop the speed here to something like maybe as little as 10. And it will also test our max and min as well because it will mean that we should be able to see that max is 20% and min is 10%. If we don't get steps, then it means the power is not changing. If we do get steps, then we know that the actual computer is changing from 10 to 20% power as it gets further down into this black region. Now, the other thing that we're going to set, we're gonna set output direct. Now, I know this from previous experience that if you don't put output direct, all that will happen is you'll get funny results. The final parameter that we can play with is at the bottom here. It's called the interval. Now this is the, when we talked about engraving, real engraving, we were talking about a tool being used which was triangular in nature so that as you increase the depth of cut you also increase the width of the cut as well. This point one that's shown in here is the spacing between our parallel lines but of course we don't have the opportunity with a light beam to change its width it's going through a lens and it will remain exactly the same width the only thing that we can do is change its depth and unlike normal engraving changing its depth will not change its width the beam depending on the type of lens you've got in your beam could be 0.075 to 0.15. Uh, my beam is about 0.075 to 0.1. So I'm going to leave it at 0.1. So to get the same sort of effect that the old engravers got, we have to approach the problem in a different way. And that's something which we'll come on to later, I think. But in the first instance, what we want to do is just verify that as we change the color gray, we change the depth of cut, 
we're taking this in very simple baby steps trying to learn the technique from the basics upwards. Now we're going to use a piece of acrylic to do this test on because it gives nice consistent results. I'm going to set the focus about a millimetre, maybe a millimetre and a half low because I've only got a very short focal length lens in there and as we get further into engraving I might have to change this up to a, a two and a half inch lens but at the moment I've still got my one and a half inch lens in here. Oh, listen to that, we can, we can actually hear the beam switching off there. I'm now going to put the speed up to 100. Okay, we'll now put it up from 100, we'll go up to 200. And then from 200 we'll go up to 400. Well let's just move the head out of the way. just clean them up. I think if we just zoom into about there we can see where the light is catching these. Now, this one is really deep and we can definitely see steps between here and here and here and here and there's a bit of a change here but the steps are not obvious because it's starting to get a bit rough change 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 you can't really see much change there and this one well you can see that it's getting deeper but there's virtually no change in the steps and this one of course is so fast that you can't see anything so the only way that we're ever going to be see any depth change is if we go slowly. Right, we're now going to turn the afterburners on. We're going to run this at 75% power and about 50 millimetres a second. That's not quite enough to burn through the 8 millimetre material, but it will be getting pretty deep at the end of it. So we'll see what we get. This should be rather interesting. The steps might not be linear, but uh, fingers crossed. To be honest, I think the only way that we're going to see this is if I cut it out. I think when we look at that last one in a very good light, we can certainly see we've got depth. But look at the difference between the first step. That's probably because the power is divided disproportionately in the higher band rather than down at the low end. Whereas in fact when we look at the start, now with this first one we knew that we had linear relationship between power and percentage so we would expect more even steps on the grey scale and mm, we sort of have we can certainly see that we've got big steps between step one, two, three and four then tends to get a bit messy as we get to the last two blacks they're certainly very messy, they're not very clean cuts except when we're going very fast that may be to do with the line spacing and my lens. More experimentation required there. 
So I think the first one was probably the most successful one. Linear range, slow power.